वेरी गुड इवनिंग गाइस गुड इवनिंग ऑल ऑफ यू प्लीज कंफर्म इफ द ऑडियो एंड वीडियो इज क्लियर टू एवरी वन इज द ऑडियो एंड वीडियो क्लियर टू एवरी वन wonderful wonderful so shall we start now so it's a day 3 of uh, acca financial reporting revision in the day 1 and day 2 we have discussed about the multiple chapters like property plan and equipment uh, intangible assets investment uh, properties uh, then we discuss about the borrowing cost then we discuss about the impairment of assets these all the chapters in day 1 in day 2 we discussed about uh, the leases financial instruments and uh, revenue now here comes the day 3 of the acca financial reporting revision session now those who are uh, watching the uh, classes please please like the video please like the class okay now coverage so in this chap in this uh, class we will be covering with the income taxes we will be discussing non current assets held for sale and discontinued operations okay third will be the provisions uh, and contingent liabilities and the contingent assets okay then uh, events after the reporting date and effects of changes in the foreign exchange rates so these are chapters which will be discussing in today's class now moving on to topic 1 income taxes but before i move on to the topic 1 of income taxes tell me guys how is the preparation going on how is the preparation going on tell me how is the preparation going on less than 5 days uh, remaining for the exam less than 5 days remaining for the exam tell me how is the preparation going on josh definitely should be high jaden uh, josh is always high <laughs> tell me how is the preparation going on wonderful great 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 well now now <laughs> so uh, starting with the income taxes okay nervousness is uh, quite very normal uh, because you have the exams in the upcoming week so nervousness is quite very normal okay if you are not nervous then this is something to worry if you are not nervous or if you are not anxious or if you are not you can say uh, worried about the exams then this is something to worry if you are worried about the exams then it's you are normal then you are normal now so let's start the topic one for the day that is uh, income taxes now uh, as you remember we discussed in our classes that uh, income taxes uh, is in uh, income taxes that is tax expense are divided into two components what is the two component what are two components the two components are current tax and deferred tax current tax and deferred tax now under current tax and deferred tax under current tax and defer tax we have to first understand what should be the accounting treatment that we need to give to the current tax then we need to understand what is the accounting treatment that we need to give to the defer tax okay now <coughs> but before i dis uh, discuss this i will let me announce one more part uh, after today's session after today's session i will request all of you watching this session i will request all of you watching this session that uh, please uh, visit acca practice platform and solve a uh, pre mock exam okay pre exam mock okay it is there in the acca practice platform for september 2023 exams okay solve that solve that now for section a and section b they will check it uh, there's there, there itself okay and you will get the marks out of 60 you will get the marks then section c part i am going to discuss tomorrow section c of acca fr pre mock exam september 2023 i will be discussing tomorrow okay so please uh, solve the pre mock today or any time before the to tomorrow's class so tomorrow we will be discussing section c of the pre mock exam you have solved it very good how much did you score yes in section a and section b how much did you score let's make it public okay now so income taxes 
Now, in income taxes, we were discussing that the tax expense is of uh, has two components that is the current tax and the defer tax. Right now, we will discuss separately about the current tax and then about the defer tax. Moving to the current tax and the defer tax, what is the meaning of them? What is the meaning? Okay. The meaning is, is amount payable or recoverable for the current year in accordance with the provisions of the income tax act in accordance with the provisions of income tax act okay so basic the basic uh, basically it says that uh now let me explain this part let's suppose this is the year this is the year now in during this year during this year you earned an income of let's suppose dollar 1000 okay you earn an income of dollar 1000 okay now and the tax rate in the country is at the rate of let's suppose 30 percent okay now as per the as per the tax uh, laws on the regulations in the respective country okay now the tax uh, expense that comes is 300 now this is called as this is called as current tax this is called as current tax okay now so basically what i mean to say here is what i mean to say here is the income tax expense calculated as per the income tax act of the respective country is called as current tax is called as current tax okay so basically current tax is the tax payable or recoverable now what is the meaning of recoverable now if as per the calculation if as per the calculation uh, i don't need to pay anything to the uh, to the taxes and authority rather i am expecting a refund rather i am expecting a refund okay rather i'm expecting a refund okay now uh, understand when i say refund few students gets confused here let me explain that part let's suppose as part of advanced taxes as part of advanced taxes you have paid here let's suppose uh, 100 here and 100 here okay let's suppose you have paid an advanced tax you have paid an advance tax you have paid an advance tax so total advance tax you have paid is 200 total advance tax that you have paid is 200 okay now the tax payable that comes is 100 okay now some students gets confused here that they say sir the tax payable that is coming to me uh, in the in here is 100 so is the current tax 100 no my friend no the current tax the current tax is the current tax is 300 the current tax is 300 okay this 100 is your liability is 100 is your liability but the actual tax payable for the income which you have earned is 300 is 300 okay now let's suppose instead of 200 i have i have already paid an advance tax of uh, 350 so 50 dollars uh, is refundable to me 50 dollar is refundable to me okay now can i say this is a, uh, this is a uh, tax recoverable can i say is this a tax recoverable i'm talking about no i'm not talking about this tax recoverable let's suppose okay i'm not talking this is a tax asset okay i'm not talking about this here let's suppose instead of income you have a loss in the current year of 100 you have a loss in the current year of 100 and the income tax in your country income tax law in your country says that if the entity earns a profit entity will pay tax to us and if the entity incurs a loss if the entity incurs a loss i will give the benefit of the tax on that to the uh, entity okay so meaning thereby this is not a tax expense this is a tax income or a tax credit of 300 okay so i'm talking about this i'm talking about this i'm talking about this okay so basically a uh, tax current tax means what is the what is the amount that you have earned multiplied by the tax rate multiplied by the tax rate gives you the tax payable or recoverable gives you the tax payable or recoverable okay now now further what is the meaning of tax asset or a tax liability you just need to compare you just need to compare what is the amount that you have already paid what is the amount that you are required to pay just compare let's suppose here you have already paid let's suppose in this situation you have already paid 200 you have already paid 200 this amount is already paid 
you have already paid 200 right and what was the amount payable what was the amount payable payable was 300 and you have already paid 200 means this is 100 is payable is your liability is payable is your liability right now again taking another situation 300 is payable but you have already paid 350 right so this 50 is your asset is your asset tax asset this is your tax asset okay okay now this liability or the asset we record in sofp this tax expense we record as current tax in p and l we record in p and l is that clear to all of you now tell me is that clear to all of you so far so uh, what i discussed so far is tax uh, payable uh, as per the income tax law is called as current tax okay now the in the tax on the income earned is called as the current tax okay this current tax has to be reported in p and l has to be recorded as an expense has to be recognized as an expense in p and l now uh, if uh, the amount that you have already paid okay then compare the amount that you have already paid versus the amount which you are required to pay that is current tax okay compare advance tax with the current tax compare advance tax with the current tax if the current tax is higher than the advance tax meaning thereby the tax payable is higher than the tax that you have already paid the differential is your liability differential is your liability okay if advance tax is higher means the amount that you have already paid is higher than the amount which you are required to pay it is your tax asset it is your tax asset now see here amount that is already that payable is greater than the amount already paid then you have to recognize current tax liability amount payable is less than the amount you've already paid is called as current tax asset how will you measure current tax taxable profit or loss multiplied by the tax rate if you multiply taxable profit multiply tax rate that you will then you will get the current tax okay now further what is the amount which you will recognize in p and l definitely what is the provision for the current year that is that is uh, income in current year multiplied by the tax rate definitely this is what you will record in p and l but additionally additionally if there is a debit balance that is under provision in the previous year if if there is a debit balance debit opening balance or you can say under provision in the previous year okay debit opening balance means under provision in the previous year okay so that you have to add and if there is a credit balance means over provision made in the previous year that you have to reduce that you have to reduce and you will get the current tax expense for the current year is it clear everyone tell me guys the amount to be recognized in pnl is it clear to all of you come on tell me now let us solve a question on this So what does the question say? Uh, Jasper's Orange Company uh, trial balance at 31st December 20x3 shows a debit balance. A debit balance means, tell me what will you do? Debit balance means what will you do? Add or less? You will add. Add. Okay. On current tax and a credit balance of deferred tax. I am not discussing anything about deferred tax as of now okay because i have not explained that defer tax the directors have estimated the provision for income tax for the year is 4.5 million okay now so what is the question asking for what is the amount of income tax recognized in jasper's orange company statement of profit or loss right what is the amount to be recognized in p and uh, p and l so in p and l tax expense you will record two things tell me what and what you will record current tax and you will record deferred tax since i have not explained deferred tax as of now so i am not writing anything about deferred tax but now current tax what is the provision required in the current year 4.5 million now what is the debit balance for the previous year 0 0.7 million so what is the amount of current tax what is the amount of current tax 5.2 million okay now we will come back to this question again when i will explain the deferred tax part okay but so far is it clear everyone so far is it clear everyone 
now very good very good all of you now offsetting uh, current tax and current liabilities it says that if you have a advanced tax that you have already paid and if you have a provision for the current year meaning thereby this amount payable or amount paid it says in the in the sofp you have to record a net balance in the sofp you have to record the net balance okay just offset offset and when you will say of when when can you offset you can offset if there is a legally enforceable right if there is a legally enforceable right now when will you have legally enforceable right when the tax provision and the advance tax both are from the same tax and authority let's suppose let's suppose in india if in india i have a tax provision from indian tax authority and an advance tax that i have paid to a us tax authority can i set knock off both of them can i set off set off both of them can I set off both of them? No, they are from different tax and authority and hence I cannot set off. But in the similar case, but in the similar case, if I have a provision for tax for to for Indian tax authority and 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 also I have an advanced tax paid to Indian tax authority, then this both I can set off. Then this both I can set off. Okay, because uh, it is uh, it is payable and recoverable from the same tax on authority and an entity intends to settle it on a net basis. Okay, so this is called offsetting. Now tell me, is current tax clear to all of you? Can I move on to the deferred tax part? Is current tax clear to all of you? Can I move on to the deferred tax part? Come on, guys! Please like the video. done okay now moving on to the deferred tax part moving on to the deferred tax part now in the deferred tax tell me what are the steps that we take first of all tell me why are we calculating deferred tax why are we calculating deferred tax because because what happens let me again uh, go back to my discussion and explain why because what happens in account this is accounts books and this is tax books and this is tax books this is account books and this is tax books okay now let's suppose uh, income here comes to 1000 income here is 1000 okay or not income let's suppose profit let's suppose profit this profit how are we calculating as per the provisions of ias or ifrs now here here the income what we do is we say income is 1000 but there is a difference but there is a difference uh, due to which we have to do some adjustment we have to do some adjustment of 300 and my income becomes 1300 and my income becomes 1300 okay now the tax rate in the country is let's suppose 30 percent and it becomes 390 tax rate is 390 now let's suppose tax rate in the country is 30 percent okay is 30 percent now let's suppose here i will show a tax expense of current tax of uh, 390 tell me a normal layman person will definitely get confused by seeing this he will say that the tax rate in the country is 30 percent but the company is paying 390 but the company is paying 390 okay uh, is it correct is it correct now it will confuse him it will confuse him right why because of this difference why because of this difference why because of this difference and the entity knows that though it is a difference now but it will get reversed in the years to come it will get reversed in the years to come it will get reversed in the years to come what is the difference for what is this difference for it might be for let's suppose in uh, when we are preparing the accounts books we uh, recognize provision we recognize provision right what is the general entity that we pass for provision for an expense expense account debit to provision for expense but in the tax books they do not recognize they do not consider provision okay they say when you are making the actual payment when you are making the actual payment it is then only i will allow you deduction right so in the current year i have made a provision but i have not paid the actually amount i have not paid the amount so here that expense is added back that expense is added back okay that expense is added back right so this is a this is an adjustment this is an adjustment but in the years to come in the next year this amount will be allowed the deduction but it will not be coming up here so meaning what is happening here is 
this expense of 300 is coming in accounts books in current year but it will come in the tax books in the future year might be second year or third year so it is coming in both the books it is coming in both the books it is coming in accounts books and tax books both but there is a difference of the time but there is a difference of the time right so they are temporary differences they are temporary differences so uh, standard says that since they are temporary differences and because of those temporary difference it does not follow accrual accounting it does not follow accrual accounting and hence what i will do here is i will make an adjustment and i will record a deferred tax and i will record a deferred tax what is the meaning of defer tax? I will record a defer tax on this temporary difference, right? What I will do minus 90. So my tax expense will become how much? 300. Now I will record a profitability of 700, right? This is my profit after tax. This is my profit after tax, right? So this is the whole concept and the logic behind the defer tax. Now how to calculate defer tax? So to calculate the, to calculate the defer tax we have to find the difference we have to find the difference between accounts books and we have to find the difference between accounts books and tax books we have to find the difference between accounts books and tax books now to find the difference between accounts books and tax books we have two approaches we have two approaches in financial statements we have p and l and we have sofp and we have sofp tell me is uh, tell me is there any transaction which gets uh, recognized in p and l but not in sofp any transaction which gets recognized only in p and l but there is no impact on sofp can you name any transaction any transaction which gets recognized only in p and l but not in sofp there are no such transactions there are no such transactions let's suppose if you talk about uh, revenue revenue will definitely increase my profitability and it will increase my equity right expenses it will decrease my profitability and it will decrease my equity right purchase of assets so it will uh, it will be uh, assets account debit to bank or assets account debit to liability means uh, assets increases and asset decreases or assets increases and liability increases right now are there any transactions which does not impact sofp any transaction which does not impact sofp no whatever are the transactions all the transaction has to impact sofp in every manner whatever are the transaction whatever is the transaction there cannot be in any single case where you can find that this transaction is impact is not impacting sofp okay it will it will it will impact sofp it will impact so uh, to find the differences standard says that i will take sofp approach i will take sofp approach now to find the differences what i will do is i will take sofp approach to take that approach what i will do step one is compute carrying amount of the asset and the liability what is the carrying amount of the asset and the liability then calculate what is the tax base of the asset and the liability meaning thereby carrying amount means what as per is or ifrs tax base means what right here it's a carrying amount of asset or liability it's a carrying amount of asset or liability as per income tax act as per income tax act it's a carrying amount of income tax uh, in, in Asset and liability is the carrying amount of asset and liability as per income tax act, meaning thereby I have to compare the carrying amount of the asset and liability as per the IS, as per the IFRS and as per income tax. I have to compare these two. Now, after comparing, I have to find, I have to find the temporary difference. After comparing these two, I have to find the temporary differences. Now, these temporary difference, I have to classify as taxable or deductible. How will I classify? I will tell you. How will I classify? I will tell you right then i have to determine the tax rate okay then i have to calculate and recognize the deferred tax asset or deferred tax liability what shall we recognize deferred tax asset or deferred tax liability i will discuss that with you okay now then once you have recognized that what is the amount of closing deferred tax asset or a deferred tax liability and the question will already provide you what is the opening deferred tax asset or deferred tax liability then you have to find the movement then you have to find the movement okay that what is the movement in the deferred tax asset or a deferred tax liability and then do the accounting for this movement okay then we will discuss about the movement also then i will also further discuss how will we present the uh, deferred tax uh, in the financial statements be it profit and loss be it oci be it equity be it uh, sofp whatever it is okay we'll discuss we'll discuss that okay then we'll discuss how can we uh, offset deferred tax asset and deferred tax 
defer taxation and defer tax liability can be offset that's what we will discuss so these are the nine steps in accounting for the defer tax these are the nine steps in accounting for the deferred tax is that clear to all of you a, a, a prima facie approach a prima facie is it clear to all of you definitely i will be discussing each of them in detail but tell me prima facie is it clear to all of you so what we have to do we have to find the carrying amount as per ifrs we have to find the carrying amount as per income tax compare both and find the difference then see this difference is taxable difference or deductible difference taxable difference or deductible difference then once i have found the difference i will find what is the tax rate in the country then apply this tax rate on the difference and find the defer tax asset or defer tax liability once you have found the defer tax asset or defer tax liability find the movement because you once you find the defer tax asset or defer tax liability that is the closing defer tax asset or closing defer tax liability find the movement what is the movement now this movement you have to take it to p and l or oci or other equity we will discuss that okay we will discuss that then then we will discuss about the presentation and we will discuss about the offsetting so this is what we have to do for recognizing deferred tax So now tell me, let's move on to each steps one by one now. Compute carrying amount of an asset or a liability. Tell me, uh, can you compute carrying amount of asset or liability? Right, as per the IES or IFRS. So as per the respective standards, you can calculate that. So I am not discussing step number one. Right, so we have discussed about the standards. So as per the respective standard, you can calculate the carrying amount of the asset or the liability as per the respective standard you can calculate. Okay, now moving on to step number two, tax base of an asset or a tax base of a liability. Now coming here to tax base of an asset or a liability. So we'll discuss first tax base of an asset. Mark my words here, I'm not writing here equity. I am not writing here equity. So there is no defer tax requirement on equity. There is no defer tax requirement on equity. Okay. Now tax base of an asset. Now before I discuss the tax base of an asset, just read this logic. It says that IS 12 requires creation of defer tax asset or liability only if it is probable that the recovery or settlement of the carrying amount of the asset or liability will have tax consequences if it has tax consequences if the recovery of the asset or the settlement of liability has tax consequences it is then you have to recognize a defer tax asset or a defer tax liability otherwise no otherwise no otherwise no how will you click how will you calculate defer uh, tax base of an asset the standard says that if it is an asset if it is an asset then definitely then definitely it will have future economic benefits just try to recall the non-current asset standard right just try to recall the non-current asset standard right uh, recognition principle future economic benefits are probable to flow to the entity can you recall that is 16 38 40 right future economic benefits are probable to flow to the entity if there are no future economic benefits or if future economic benefits reduces then we impair the asset then we impair the asset as per ias 36 as per ias 36 impairment of assets can you recall these can you recall these guys wonderful now the standard says that if there are future economic benefits and the future economic benefits are taxable are taxable then uh, tax base is equals to future deductions from the asset then the tax base is equals to future deductions from the asset meaning thereby asset will get recover how will you recover the asset by way of its future economic benefits right means the recovery of the asset has tax consequences recovery of the asset has tax consequences okay then tax base is equals to future deductions available from the asset now if the asset has the future economic benefits which are not taxable which are not taxable in that case tell me if the recovery of the asset has no tax consequences 
if the recovery of the asset has no tax consequences do we need to recognize defer tax in that case do we need to recognize defer tax on that case if the recovery of the asset has no tax consequences will we recognize defer tax no means defer tax is equals to zero then how how do we derive defer tax by finding the temporary difference means if it has no tax consequences if the recovery of the asset has no tax consequences it means that the temporary difference is zero the temporary difference is zero right now temporary difference is zero means what is the meaning of temporary difference carrying amount minus tax base is equal to temporary difference carrying amount minus tax base is equal to temporary difference right now uh, to make it zero what they have done is what they have done is they, made, they said that the tax base is equals to carrying amount of the asset itself right so meaning thereby temporary difference is equals to carrying amount is equals to carrying amount minus tax base now what is the tax base it is equals to carrying amount so it will equal to zero it will be equal to zero meaning thereby if the recovery of the asset has no tax consequences then then we take carrying amount of the asset for that carrying amount of the asset for the reason why it will make the temporary difference zero this is you can say you can say this is the jugar technology applied this is jugar technology applied okay carrying amount uh Tanvi, you are correct but uh, you should have said tax base is equal to carrying amount okay now is it clear now how do we find carrying amount of a tax sorry tax base of a liability so for that the standard says that the tax base of a liability is equal to carrying amount of the liability minus future deductions available from the liability future deductions available from the liability okay let me take certain examples examples for a set let's suppose you have an interest receivable you have an interest receivable of dollar 100 okay which is taxed on cash basis now tell me now tell me this interest receivable does it have future economic benefits yes what is the future economic benefits you will recover you will realize this interest you will realize this interest okay you have earned it you have earned it but not yet realized but not yet realized okay so you will realize it in the future now is it taxable yes when i will recover this it i have to pay tax on that when i will recover this i have to pay tax on that okay so what will be happen so it is taxable so now carrying amount definitely is equals to dollar 100 now what is my tax base tax base is equals to future deductions tell me will i get any deduction in the tax books from this asset will i get any deduction from this in the tax books no it will give rise to tax income not tax it will not give rise to any deductions so deductions will be equals to zero right I, let me write it like this tax base is equals to future deductions is equals to zero is equals to zero right and hence and hence your temporary difference and hence your temporary difference is equals to 100 your temporary difference is equals to 100 right and if the tax rate in the country is a uh, 30 percentage so it becomes uh 30 tax expense is 30 right now now understand how will i recognize this in the p and l how will I recognize this in the P and L? First of all, let's pass the journal entry. Let's pass the journal entry. Let's pass the journal entry for the same. The journal entry will be, now tell me this temporary difference is a taxable temporary difference or a deductible temporary difference. Is it a taxable or deductible? Guys, I believe you have already studied the tax chapter once. Okay and you are just here to revise so please help me is it taxable or deductible what is the meaning of taxable or deductible what is the meaning of taxable or deductible it means it means that it means if the if this temporary difference will increase my tax payments in the future it will increase my tax payments in the future it means it is taxable if it will decrease my tax payments in the future it is deductible now here what happens this or uh, this it will get taxed in the future means it will increase my tax payments in the future 
so it is called as taxable temporary difference and now taxable temporary difference give rise to what taxable temporary difference give rise to what it gives rise to deferred tax tell me asset or liability asset or a liability asset or a liability it gives rise to deferred tax liability it gives rise to deferred tax liability uh, then we it's not deductible dif difference it's taxable temporary difference okay because it because because it gives uh, it gives future taxable income it will be taxed in the future it will be taxed in the future it will increase my future tax payments okay now now so a uh, general entry will be deferred tax expense account debit to deferred tax liability right so in the p and l how will you present it in the p and l how will you present it it will be like this so you will record an interest income of how much dollar 100 now in the tax expense in the tax expense there are two parts current tax and deferred tax so current tax is zero deferred tax is how much deferred tax expense is how much 30 right deferred tax expense is how much 30 right so you will record here tax expense of 30 and you will record profit after tax of 70 right now in sofp how will you present this in sofp how will you present this in sofp so in sofp you will record interest receivable of dollar 100 and deferred tax liability deferred tax liability of dollar uh, 30 deferred tax liability of dollar 30 is that clear to all of you tell me guys come on is that clear to all of you yes nisan you can write deferred tax expense or deferred tax charge both have the one and the same meaning okay deferred tax charge account debit to deferred tax liability is also correct is it clear everyone tell me guys come on so this is how we have to record in the now now let us let me take up one example for liability let me take one example for liability 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 example is let's suppose provision for gratuity provision for gratuity amounting to dollar 100 amounting to dollar 100 oh, okay now amounting to dollar 100 now so what happens uh, now this provision for gratuity is a liability now so carrying amount of this liability is definitely dollar 100 now the tax base tax base is dollar uh, is equals to carrying amount minus future deduction so carrying amount is 100 minus future deductions so will i get deduction in the books of tax in the current year no i don't get a deduction of i don't get a deduction of tax i don't get a deduction in the books of tax for a provision for a provision i will get deduction only and only if when i actually pay this amount right so in the future when i will actually pay this amount in the future when i will actually pay this provision I will get a deduction in the future. I will get a deduction in the future, right? Amounting to rupees a dollar hundred, amounting to dollar hundred. So tax base is equals to dollar zero, right? So what is my temporary difference? What is my temporary difference? My temporary difference is a uh, dollar hundred is the carrying amount minus tax base is zero is equals to dollar hundred is a temporary difference. Now is this temporary difference taxable or deductible? Tell me. Is it taxable or deductible? Is it a taxable temporary difference or a deductible temporary difference? It's a, it will, uh, it will, it will give rise to deduction in the future. So it's a deductible temporary difference. It's a deductible temporary difference, right? Deductible temporary difference give rise to what? Deferred tax asset. Deductible temporary difference give rise to what? Deferred tax asset, right? So journal entry is, journal entry for this is deferred tax asset account debit how much 30 but that is at the rate of 30 percent at the rate of 30 percent is 30 right to deferred tax credit 30 credit means what income credit is what income income now how will you present this in the uh, p and l how will you present this in the p and l now in p and l 
in p and l uh, we will record a provision for gratuity as an expense of dollar 100 right now tax expense tax expense so it has two components current tax and deferred tax so current tax will be nil right a uh, current tax will be nil because uh, neither we have to pay tax on this nor uh, nor i will get a deduction of this in the current year because i have not paid this but in the future year i will definitely get a deduction of this right so i will record a deduction here okay or i should write it like this it's an expense it's this one so 30 this is your 70 70 is your this one right now in sofp in sofp how will i present this one in sofp how will i present this one so i will record a deferred tax asset of 30 and i will record a provision for gratuity of 100 is that clear everyone tell me guys is that clear everyone tell me guys now so i have taken up an example of an asset and a liability to explain the relevance and the meaning of the tax base of an asset and a tax base of a liability is it is that clear everyone come on guys tell me is that clear everyone Wonderful. Now, see, uh, so far what we have done, so far what we have done is we told that uh, we have to find the carrying amount of the asset and the liability. We have to find the tax base of an asset and the liability. Come here again to the steps. Uh, what is the carrying amount this was uh, presumed that you know now compute tax base of an asset and a liability we discussed right now then temporary difference is equals to what is the carrying amount of an asset as per the income tax and as per the accounts the difference which comes up is called as temporary difference the difference which comes up is called as temporary difference okay so temporary difference is equals to carrying amount of the asset minus tax base of an asset or carrying amount of a liability minus tax base of a liability this is called as temporary difference now moving on to step number four classify the temporary difference as taxable or deductible so come to here come here come here now classify temporary difference classify temporary differences okay now when you have to classify the temporary difference you have to understand this temporary difference what is the impact of this temporary difference will it increase future tax payments it is a taxable temporary difference will it decrease tax payments in the future it is called as it is called as a uh, deductible temporary difference like for example here like for example here this uh, interest receivable will get taxed in the future will get taxed in the future means uh, the company needs to pay the tax on interest receivable in the future so it will increase it will increase the future tax payments and hence it is a deductible temporary difference now this provision for gratuity this provision for gratuity it will be considered as an expense in the tax books in the future it is it will be considered as an expense in the tax books in the future means 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 when in the future i will consider this as an expense it will reduce my taxable profit and hence it will reduce my tax tax expense tax payments it will reduce my tax payments so hence it is a deductible temporary difference hence hence the deductible temporary difference now this was the logic but for those who just wants to uh, by heart the formula so for them also i have this so this is for the person who wants to understand the logic and this is for the person who wants to just mug up the formula clear now the standard further goes on to state that taxable temporary difference will give rise to deductible uh, deferred tax liability why because it will increase my future tax payments 
right what is the meaning of liability a present obligation arising out of past events which will uh, lead to outflow in the future present obligation arising out of past events which will be settled in the future see here this taxable temporary difference is arising due to what interest accrued interest accrued which the interest has accrued in the past so it is arising out of past events which uh, gives an obligation see if it is accrued if an income is accrued can i avoid tax on that can i avoid the payment of tax on that no 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 i cannot avoid the tax so it is a present obligation arising out of past events when i have to pay tax in the future so it's a liability it's a liability so hence i have to recognize a deferred tax liability now deductible temporary difference what is the meaning of this what is the meaning of this it will give me benefits in the future by in the form of reduced tax payments it will give me benefits in the future in the form of reduced tax payments so right since it's the future it gives rise to future economic benefits it will it will be said as deferred tax asset it will we will recognize a deferred tax asset for the same is it clear everyone is it clear everyone so so far what we studied find the carrying amount of the asset or liability then find the tax books of asset and liability compare the, the, the compare these two compare these two then uh, find the temporary difference that is carrying amount minus tax base then uh, this temporary difference this temporary difference uh, classify as taxable or deductible then find what is the tax rate in the country multiply the tax rate with the temporary difference and so i will say here i can say it here like this the temporary difference multiplied by tax rate is equals to multiplied by tax rate is equals to deferred tax asset or deferred tax liability Is it clear everyone? Tell me guys, come on. Is it clear everyone? So, so far we studied till here. We studied uh, carrying amount, we studied tax base, we studied temporary difference, we studied about the classification of temporary difference as taxable and deductible, then we studied about the tax rate, then we studied about the calculation and recognized deferred tax or deferred tax liability. This we have studied so far till here. Tell me guys, is it clear everyone till here? Please give me a confirmation, then I'll move ahead. Then step number seven, accounting for the movement. Come here. Now the standard says that uh, in the question or in real life, you will know the opening deferred tax asset or a deferred tax liability. It can be deferred tax asset or it can be deferred tax liability. It can be anything. It can be anything or deferred tax asset or deferred tax liability. Closing, you know again deferred tax asset. It can be or deferred tax liability it can be anything again it can be anything again okay now whatever is the movement whatever is the movement you have to rec you might have to recognize in equity or other comprehensive income or p l depending on where the base transaction is accounted for depending where the base transaction is accounted for if the question is silent if the question is silent then we assume that the base transaction is accounted for in p and l if the question is silent, we then we assume that the base transaction is accounted for in the PNL. If there is any transaction which pertains to OCI or equity, the question will separately mention that. The question will separately mention that. Is that clear to all of you? Tell me, guys. Come on. Is that clear to all of you? Tell me. Okay, now this is about the movement. For movement, I will explain in a better manner using the question. Okay, uh, but yes, I have explained it. Now, presentation, I will discuss offsetting rule is same as above. So, I am not discussing it again. Same as above. Offsetting rules are same as above. So, I am not discussing it separately. Now, moving on to the accounting for the movement, which I will explain using this, this question again. Okay, now coming to this question again. So, what does the question say? Read this question. It says, I'm highlighting the deferred tax part. Okay. It says credit balance is this much. Okay. So this is the opening balance, opening deferred tax liability. This is the opening deferred tax liability. Okay. Now further. Required deferred tax. 
required defer tax provision is 5.6 million so close the question gives you the opening defer tax liability the question is giving you the question is giving you opening deferred tax liability the question is giving you closing deferred tax liability the question is giving you both Uh, opening is 8.4 million the opening is 8.4 million and closing is 5.6 million both are deferred tax liability closing is 5.6 million okay krishna has a query sir when we calculate the restated on the return earnings part there is an impact uh calculate the restated on the return earnings part sometimes there there is taking the effect of increases or decreases defer tax sometimes they leave increase or decrease part why i am not able to understand your question krishna okay uh little bit uh, be little bit clear in the question or if you have any specific question pertaining to that you can send me over the whatsapp i can after the class and then we'll discuss it off okay now the question is giving you this data now further the question also gives you this data that 1.2 million 1.2 million of which relates to property revaluation now tell me uh, here it says that out of 5.6 out of 5.6 1.2 million is for property revaluation tell me where does the property revaluation gain or loss goes where does the property revaluation gain or loss is accounted for tell me where where is it accounted for the property revaluation gain or loss property revaluation gain or loss is accounted where because if the base transaction is in pnl the defer tax impact will go to pnl if the base transaction is in oci the defer tax will be recognized in oci if the base transaction is in equity then the uh, defer tax statement will be recognized in equity right property revaluation meaning thereby applying the principles of is 16 considering it is a property plant and equipment the gain or the revaluation gain on that will be recognized in revaluation reserve which is a component of uh, which is a component of other co other comprehensive income okay which is a component of other comprehensive income okay okay other comprehensive income right so now so what happens so since 1.2 million is property revaluation hence we will recognize 1.2 in oci not in pnl right so how do how to do that see here simple simple what you can do is prepare defer tax liability account prepare defer tax liability account and it will give you all the answers it will give you all the answers so what is the opening what is your opening tell me what is your opening opening is 8.4 million closing is 5.2 million right now what is the what is the journal entry for revaluation what is the journal entry for revaluation tell me what is the journal entry for revaluation asset account debit to revaluation reserve meaning thereby it is an income it is an income right income means it will give rise to defer tax expense when there is an income it will give rise to defer tax expense it will give rise to defer tax expense so what is the journal entry for this part it will give rise to deferred tax charge account debit to deferred tax liability right now what is the amount 1.2 million and it this deferred tax charge to will go to oci so i will write here to oci how much 1.2 million right now balance this account balance this account so what happens here 8.4 plus 1.2 is 9.6 minus 5.2 is the differential will go to p and l the differential will go to p and l so how much uh, 8.4 plus 1.2 minus 5.2 is equals to 4.4 million is equals to 4.4 million It's 5.6. Okay, I've written here 5.2. I'm sorry. It's 5.6. Uh, let me write here 5.6. So here this figure will be different. So it will be uh, 8.4 plus 1.2 minus 5.6 is 4.0 million. Is 4.0 million. Tell me yes or no. Tell me yes or no. Now come back to here. Come here. 
come here so here the deferred tax will be negative 4 million so the answer will be uh, 1.2 million why negative because it's the deferred tax credit income see deferred tax income deferred tax income it's a deferred tax income deferred tax credit right because the liability is reducing from 9.6 to 5.6 when the liability reduces it's an income when the liability reduces it's an income okay nisan is asking if 1.2 million uh, of this property revaluation is from the investment property then then the revaluation gain of the investment property is recognized in the p and l then i will not do this treatment i will not do this treatment directly i will recognize the difference and transfer everything to the p and l okay but the question will not say like that okay it's a, it will not be initial property okay it will not be initial property because if the question is silent in the exam assume it is a property plan and equipment if the question is silent in the exam assume it is property plan and equipment unless the question specifically mentions investment property uh, though i have never seen a question which mentions investment property so far i have never seen a question like that okay so this is what you will do tell me is it clear is it clear tell me guys come on okay now now in this question itself let me uh, though it is not asking but let me uh, do one more thing i will show the presentation also i will show the presentation also so uh, in uh, p and l let me show the presentation in p and l i don't know about any income or expenses but i know about the tax expense in the tax expense in p and l how will i show it I will show current tax, I will show defer tax. Okay, so current tax will be 5.2, defer tax will be 4.0 negative. It is 1.2 million tax ka expense. Then further, prepare, let me prepare OCI, other comprehensive income. other comprehensive income now in oci i will record revaluation gain uh, net of defer tax okay so what is the amount 1.2 million is the uh, revaluation gain what is the amount of defer tax what is the amount of not 1.2 what is the amount of revaluation gain the question is not giving you the amount of revaluation gain okay fine so question is not giving you the amount of revaluation gain so i am assuming a figure okay i am assuming a figure 1.2 divided by 0.3 is 4 million i am assuming a figure okay don't say that so from where you got this 4 million i have assumed this figure this is the amount of revaluation gain minus 1.2 million 1.2 million minus so it will you also have to show 2.8 million in the OCI like this okay now what will happen in SOFP what will happen in SOFP so in SOFP you will have to record uh, uh, revaluation reserve separately how much 4 million and you will have to record deferred tax liability separately how much 1.2 million so this is how I will show in the SOFP is it clear everyone tell me guys come on is it clear everyone tell me guys this revaluation is will be forming part of other equity okay other equity other components of equity is it clear the presentation is clear to everyone is the presentation clear to everyone now now let's again come back come to the steps so we discuss the carrying amount we discuss the uh, tax base we discuss the temporary difference we discuss the classification of temporary difference as taxable or deductible we discuss the tax rate we discuss the recognition of deferred taxes or deferred tax liability we discussed about the movement also we discussed about the movement also we discussed about the presentation also and we discussed about the offsetting also tell me is the calculation and uh, presentation of deferred tax clear to all of you is the calculation and presentation of deferred tax clear to all of you be very clear be very clear be very clear when you are recognizing deferred tax uh, charge or deferred tax credit okay so be careful here be careful here okay if the deferred tax uh, leads to a deferred tax expense deferred tax leads to a deferred tax expense okay then uh, in that case uh, you will uh, recognize leads to a deferred tax expense then uh, what you will do here is 
defer tax expense then you will uh, recognize it as an expense and if it is a it's a defer tax charge and if it's a defer tax income then if it's a defer tax credit in the exam you can write charge or as expense and credit as income also in the so simple language there is no deduction of marks for that okay there is no deduction of marks for that okay now here the students are saying that uh, it should the defer tax liability uh, is 5.6 million including that okay i was just pres uh, presenting for this one fine uh, let me write total 5.6 million 5.6 million now in uh, sofp i will not show the net figure in sofp i will show the gross figures in sofp i will show the gross figures okay here i will show the net figure in oci i will show the net figure but in sofp i will show the gross figures clear yash nishan all of you is it clear everyone is it clear everyone guys come on tell me is the presentation calculation everything clear to all of you for the defer tax if anyone has any queries please discuss that with me done okay wonderful now some special cases this is special case the first special case i have already discussed with you guys can you please uh, just read it and tell me is it clear everyone revaluation gain is recognized in revaluation reserve that is other comprehensive income and has deferred tax impact of the same will also be recognized in other comprehensive income if there is a revaluation loss or gain which is to be recognized in pnl when will the revaluation gain or loss recognize in pnl so if there is a revaluation loss for the first time it will get recognized in pnl subsequently if you have a revaluation gain okay then you will recognize that revaluation gain in pnl to the extent earlier revaluation loss was recognized in pnl right in such cases in such cases you will recognize the defer tax impact of the same also in p and l though i cannot see any question on this part i cannot see any question on this part okay now so uh, if for for this part the entry will be defer tax charge account debit to defer tax liability it can be oci it can be p and l it can be anything right in oci in oci present revaluation gain as net of defer tax net see we we disclosed net see we disclosed in oci we disclosed net see we disclosed net right we disclosed net in oci now further it says that present net of defer tax then in sofp present revaluation gain that is revaluation reserve and defer tax liability separately separately is that clear everyone tell me is that clear everyone tell me guys come on now further impairment losses and inventory losses okay what uh, impairment loss is on uh, assets like property plant and equipment okay uh, you can say intangibles okay uh, right or any other uh, non current assets or any other any other non current assets on which ias 36 is applicable ias 36 is applicable okay now inventory losses means uh, the comparison of cost versus net realizable value as per ias 2 as per ias 2 okay provisions and loss allowances for expected credit losses it means what uh, impairment loss on financial assets impairment loss on financial assets how to calculate the impairment loss on financial assets is not in your syllabus but the defer tax treatment on impairment loss of financial assets is in your syllabus sir what is the meaning of impairment of financial assets what is the meaning of impairment of financial assets if you are not asking let me ask you tell me what is the meaning of impairment of financial assets can you give an example of it what is the meaning of impairment of financial assets can you give an example of it can you give an example of impairment of financial assets
एनी वन प्रोविजन फॉर बैड एंड डाउटफुल डेट्स राइट प्रोविजन फॉर बैड एंड डाउटफुल डेट्स इट्स कॉल्ड एज इम्पेयरमेंट ऑफ फाइनेंशियल असेट्स इम्पेयरमेंट ऑफ फाइनेंशियल असेट्स ओके नाउ यस बैड डेट्स रिसीवर्स रिटर्न ऑफ ऑल दीज आर इम्पेयरमेंट ऑफ फाइनेंशियल असेट्स ऑल दीज आर इम्पेयरमेंट ऑफ फाइनेंशियल असेट्स राइट सो बेसिकली आई एम टॉकिंग अबाउट द इम्पेयरमेंट ऑफ नॉन करेंट असेट्स आई एम टॉकिंग अबाउट द इम्पेयरमेंट ऑफ इन्वेंटरी आई एम टॉकिंग अबाउट द इम्पेयरमेंट ऑफ द फाइनेंशियल आई एम टॉकिंग अबाउट एवरीथिंग नाउ टेल मी ऑल दीज इम्पेयरमेंट ऑल दीज इम्पेयरमेंट गेट्स रिकोगनाइज वेयर पी एंड एल ओ सी आई और इक्विटी पी एंड एल ओ सी आई और इक्विटी टेल मी ऑल दीज इम्पेयरमेंट गेट्स रिकोगनाइज वेयर पी एंड एल ओ सी आई और इक्विटी इम्पेयरमेंट लॉस ऑलवेज 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 गेट्स रिकोगनाइज इन पी एंड एल ओनली नो वेयर एल्स इम्पेयरमेंट लॉस गेट्स रिकोगनाइज ओनली एंड ओनली इन पी एंड एल नो वेयर एल्स ओके ना वट इज दिस स्टेटमेंट सेइंग सी हियर रीड इम्पेयरमेंट लॉस ऑन नॉन करेंट असेट्स एंड इन्वेंट्री एंड फाइनेंशियल असेट्स ओके विल रिड्यूज द कैरिंग अमाउंट ऑफ द असेट will reduce the carrying amount of the asset and a corresponding expense okay and a corresponding expense in p and l and a corresponding expense in p and l okay but in tax books but in tax books entry uh, entity will get a deduction of this impairment loss only in the year of sale when i am actually selling this uh, non current assets or inventory or the financial assets when i am actually realizing these assets it is in that it is in that year itself i will get the benefit of it i will get the benefit of it in the tax books okay so now in the accounts books i am getting the benefit now i am recording as an expense now in the accounts books i am recording as an expense now in the tax books i will record when i will actually set uh, recover this asset when i will actually recover this asset okay now hence tax base remains unchanged giving rise to a temporary difference it gives rise to a temporary difference meaning thereby this temporary difference will give rise to a deduction in the future meaning thereby see let's suppose i am recognizing a provision now provision for the write off of a receivables now provision on non current assets now this loss will actually happen when i will actually sell the asset or recover the asset so in the future when i will recover less so i will have to pay less tax i will have to pay less taxes so it means it will give rise to deductible temporary difference these provisions are expenses the the expenses will give rise the expenses if they are tax deductible in the future they will give rise to defer tax asset they will give rise to defer tax asset they will give rise to defer tax asset okay now the standard says that this difference is temporary in nature and will give rise to future deductions and hence classified as deductible temporary difference and hence an entity will recognize a deferred tax asset and a corresponding impact to p and l is it clear everyone is it clear everyone okay meaning thereby whenever you have a provision uh, for impairment losses or uh, impairment loss on anything on non current assets inventory or financial assets it will give rise to defer tax asset it will give rise to defer tax asset this is what i'm trying to say here i hope it is clear now losses that can be carry forwarded losses that can be carry forward don't you think this losses uh, that can be carry forwarded meaning meaning thereby let's suppose meaning thereby let's suppose this in this year in this year 1 i have a loss i have a loss loss of dollar 100 loss of dollar 100 it can be carry forward to year 2 now in year 2 in year 2 i earned a profit of let's suppose 500 now tell me will i pay tax on 500 or will i pay tax on 400 tell me will i pay tax on 500 or 400 i will pay tax on 500 or 400 i will pay tax on 400 only right so meaning thereby this uh, this loss this loss has the capability to reduce my future taxable future tax payments this loss has the capability to reduce my future tax payments and hence the standard says that we have to recognize a deferred tax asset for the same losses that can be carry forwarded losses that can be carry forwarded will give rise to future deductions okay and hence we need to create a deferred tax asset for the same general entries again deferred tax asset account debit to deferred tax credit okay is that clear everyone is that clear everyone when i say credit when i say credit it means income defer tax income tax income when i say credit i mean to say tax income don't make a mistake in the exam here please don't make a mistake here in the exam okay so i will write here deferred tax charge increases 
टैक्स एक्सपेंस डेफर्ड टैक्स क्रेडिट डिक्रीजेस टैक्स एक्सपेंस गाइस प्लीज डोंट मेक दिस मिस्टेक प्लीज डोंट मेक दिस मिस्टेक इन द एग्जाम आई हैव सीन स्टूडेंट्स मेकिंग दिस मिस्टेक मेकिंग दिस ब्लंडर so elaine has a query sir so if expense in future is less than defer tax asset in if expense in future is less than defer tax uh, elaine can you please tell me your query is pertaining to which point is it uh, is it uh, is it pertaining to this losses because your qu question query is wrong i believe your query is wrong uh, so please uh, ideally you should have asked me the query is sir if uh, these losses if in the future years the, we don't have profit of 500 rather we have a profit of let's suppose 80 only then what will we do in that case then what will we do in that case so if it is that case though it is not a part of your fr syllabus it will be covered in sbr syllabus okay but let me give you a brief about it so standard says that first understand can you carry for to future years can you carry for to future years if you can carry for to future years then see whether you will get at least a at least 20 here if it is fine if it is that case then yes recognize a defer tax set up for for 30 for 30 dollars if you think that you cannot carry for it to here then you can recognize defer tax for 80 only not for 100 if you understood this part very good if you have not understood this last part ignore it off okay why because uh, this discussion we will do in detail at sbr level not at fr level okay elan and uh, elan if you are uh, is, uh, appearing for sbr i have already discussed this part in my uh, previous the uh, sbr revision lecture okay you can just watch the tax per tax point for that okay i have already explained this part there so this completes my topic for taxes now starting with a new topic that is non current assets held for sale and discontinued operations give me a uh, do we need to uh, know about is 12 amendment for ira such as temporary difference uh, no uh, no gabriel no 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 not required not required for fr level not required for fr level not required for fr level not required gabriel Uh, Elaine, uh, I will uh, just try to explain it further. So, what I am trying to say, if you have a loss in the current year which you can carry for to the future years, okay, then I will uh, then uh, then what I have to do here is I have to assess for the prudence basically, okay. I have to assess for the prudence, okay. Now, uh, basically, it's not only about the losses; it's about all the deductible temporary difference, okay. I have to assess for the prudence. Okay, I have to assess for the prudence. Why? Because when I say deductible temporary difference, I will say I say that it will reduce my future tax payments. My future tax payments will get reduced if I have tax payments. Assume if I don't have any tax payments in the future, then what will get reduced? Nothing, right? So meaning thereby, even if I have something which I can take a deduction in the future, I will not be able to avail the benefit of it. Okay, I will not be able to avail the benefit of it. okay and hence i will not recognize a defer tax asset for that so now but these all things now whatever i explained is uh, the last part this part uh, is not in your fr syllabus it is in the sbr syllabus there we will discuss about the prudence limits there we will discuss about the prudence limits okay now so for those who didn't understand what i have said uh, in the last uh, from here from here this 80 or this 80 or uh, this a uh, loss uh, prudence limits whatever it is if you have not understood it's totally fine it is not in your syllabus we have not discussed in our regular classes also okay we have not discussed that in our regular classes also okay so if you have not understood it's totally fine 
Now moving on to the next topic that is uh, topic number two, non-current assets held for sale and discontinued operations and discontinued operations. Now first point here is when can we classify a non-current asset as held for sale? When can we classify a non-current asset as held for sale? The standard says that I can classify a non-current asset as held for sale if it satisfies two conditions. If it satisfies two conditions. And what are the two conditions? And what are the two conditions? The two conditions are the asset must be available for sale in its present condition. The asset must be available for sale in its present condition. And the sale must be highly probable. And the sale must be highly probable. Now, what is the meaning of these two points? What is the meaning of these two points? Okay. Okay. Sale asset must be available for sale in its present condition. Whatever condition asset is in now, can I sell the asset as it is? If the answer is yes, I can classify the asset as held for sale. If the answer is no, then I cannot classify the asset as held for sale. Okay. Right. Now, now, how, what are the points? See, these are the examples. If they continue, okay, the asset, asset continue to be a vital part for the entity's ongoing operations. Entity, the asset is a very important part for the, it is a very important part for the entity's ongoing operations. So then uh, it is not an asset held for sale in the present condition. Okay, so it, it is not available for immediate sale in its present condition. Then further. Entity intends to sell in a distant future. Entity wants to sell in the distant future. Then again, it is not available for sale in the. Then again, it is not. Then it is uh, not available for sale in the present condition again. Now, property is used as headquarters. Okay, it needs to be vacated before it can be sold. Within time required to vacate the property, can the same be classified as held for sale? Yes, it can be classified as held for sale. Okay, yes, it can be classified as held for sale. Meaning thereby. I have uh, I have occupied the studio. I have occupied the studio. Okay. Now I told that I want to sell the studio. I want to sell the studio. Now I have not yet vacated the studio, but I am I am already in the process of vacating the studio, and this process will take two days time. So within two days, within these two days, can I say that it is held for sale? Yes, I can say that it is held for sale. Okay. Now, in the above case, if the property can be vacated only when the replacement is available. Now the same same example here. I am telling that uh, if I find another studio, then I will vacate the studio till the time I will occupy the studio. Then can I classify the studios held for sale? No, no, I cannot. I am again explaining it. I am I am using the studio for taking classes for taking your SEC, FR and SBR classes now. But I want to move to a, a bigger studio now. Okay, the studio is smaller in size. So I want to move to a bigger studio. Now when I want to move to a bigger studio, a larger studio now. Uh, so what I'm th thinking that I should sell it off, I will sell it off. Now. So if I'm planning to sell it off, can I say that it this studio is available for sale in its present condition? Now, case number one, if I'm already in the process of vacating the studio, yes, I can say that the set is available for sale in its present condition. Now, I am not vacating the studio, but I am saying that once I find the replacement, then I can then I can say that uh, in that case, in that case, I will cannot say that I cannot say that it is uh, classified as available for sale in its present condition. Okay. Now, manufacturing facility with a backlog of uncompleted orders. No. If a manufacturing facility is sold with a backlog of uncompleted, uncompleted orders, yes, you can say it is available for sale in its present condition. Okay, entity plans to renovate the property before selling. Now, I will give you an example. Let's suppose I have a, I have a vehicle. I have a vehicle. Okay, I have a bike. I have a bike. Now that bike, okay, that bike uh, is not uh, is not in a pro working condition. It's not in a working condition. Okay. Now I want to sell that bike. Now whoever comes to see that bike, he says that uh, since your bike is not a working condition, uh, I will not buy it. I will not buy it. So what I thought is uh, I will first get the bike repaired and then I will sell the bike. Can, is the bike in is the bike available for sale in its present condition no but if there is a buyer if i know that the buyers are there who can purchase the uh, who can purchase the bike in this condition itself then i can say that it is available for sale in its present condition okay so basically what i'm trying to say here is what i'm trying to say here is from the perspective of the asset is the asset capable of being sold immediately now in its present condition if yes 
then it, it is uh, one of the condition gets satisfied if no then one of the condition is not getting satisfied okay now then second condition is sale must be highly probable how will we assess that the sale must be highly probable the standard says that management must be committed to a plan to sell the asset okay active program to trace a buyer must have been initiated sale uh, active asset must be actively marketed at a reasonable price okay the sale is expected to be completed within one year from the date of classification and significant significant changes or withdrawal from the plan is unlikely okay so if all these conditions are satisfied if all these conditions are satisfied and the asset is available for sale in its present condition then yes we can classify the asset as held for a sale now what happens it is not that let's suppose i have this calculator if i want to cal if i want to classify this calculator as held for sale can i do that no i have to see if both of these conditions are getting satisfied or not if both the conditions are getting satisfied it is then only i can classify the asset as held for sale otherwise no otherwise no A special cases now criteria met after the reporting date means it says that this is the reporting date see my year starts from 1st january and ends on 30 uh, 31st of december okay this both the conditions met on let's suppose 15th of january 15th of january can i classify the set as held for sale no i cannot do that i cannot do that but yes i can give a disclosure it means it is a non adjusting event it is a non adjusting event okay non current assets to be abandoned or put on hold now let's suppose i had a bicycle i had a bicycle which i'm not using now which i'm not using now so it is it is it is stored in my garage it is stored in my garage okay i'm not i'm not using it off i'm not using it off okay i'm not using it off okay and neither i want to use it off in the in the future also but nor i'm selling why because i have my emotions attached to that bicycle i have my emotions attached to that bicycle okay because that is a bicycle that i used to drive uh, okay initially that i used to ride initially earlier okay when i was a child so uh, i have my emotions attached so can i say that that bicycle is held for sale no 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 okay held for sale accounting held for sale accounting so what you will do for held for sale accounting so first of all you have to find the carrying amount of the asset you have to find the carrying amount of the asset okay carrying amount of the asset on the date of change in classification after considering the impact of depreciation revaluation or impairment under the respective standards under the respective standard see on the date of change of classification i will do everything i will do everything to find the correct carrying amount if i if i if i have to if i have to uh, you can say depreciate the asset depreciate till the date of reclassification if i have to impair the asset impair till the date of reclassification as per is 36 impairment of non current assets if i have to revalue the asset revalue the asset till date of reclassification whatever you have to do you have to date do till the date of reclassification once it gets reclassified once it gets reclassified to once it gets reclassified to non current assets held for sale then nothing uh, for 16 38 40 23 nothing will get applied then nothing can get applied okay 16 38 23 40 uh, okay uh, nothing will get applied or 36 nothing will get applied okay these numbers are the standard numbers if you are not able to recall the standard numbers that's completely fine okay if you are able to re recall the standard number uh, you will not be awarded anything specific marks for that okay so whether you are able to recall the standard number or you are not able to recall the standard number it doesn't make any difference okay now so standard says first calculate the carrying amount then on every reporting date calculate the fair value less cost of disposal cost us to sell fair value less cost to sell now this fair value is as per ifrs 13 and cost to sell are the incremental cost incurred on sale okay this i have already discussed the meaning of fair value less cost of sale in our impairment standard if you can recall that okay then if fair value less cost to sell step two is lower than the carrying amount meaning thereby if the carrying amount is 100 and if the fair value less cost to sell is 90 then you have to recognize an impairment loss of 10 if the carrying amount is 90 and and the fair value less cost to sell is 102 then you have to recognize it at 100 itself there is no impairment loss there is no impairment loss as per ifrs 5 
okay understand that uh, whenever uh, you change the classification of the asset whenever you change the classification of the asset okay you have to uh, revalue the asset you have to revalue the asset at lower of at lower of carrying amount of the asset or fair value less cost of disposal okay at lower of at lower of now what students think and they make a mistake in the exam is they say that sir when the asset gets class reclassified to non current asset held for sale when the when a non current asset is reclassified to held for sale i have to record it at fair value less cost to sale okay and whatever is the difference whether gain or loss i will recognize it in the p and l no my friend no 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 so if on the date of reclassification the carrying amount is 100 and the fair value less cost to sale is 102 you will not recognize any impairment loss you will continue to recognize the asset at 100 itself you will continue to recognize the asset at 100 itself the same logic as of the impairment the same logic as of the impairment is that clear is that clear everyone now further if you reclassify the asset to held for sale the depreciation ceases the depreciation ceases on every reporting date you just need to compare the fair value less cost to disposal the fair value less cost to disposal okay like let me let me take up an example on this let's suppose the carrying amount here was 100 okay after all everything okay this is the date of reclassification okay the carrying amount is this much the fair value less cost to sale on this date was 102 so i will continue to recognize that at 100 now here the fair uh, the carrying amount is 100 again the same carrying amount becomes here okay the carrying amount comes here now the fair value is the fair value is let's suppose 95 so I will recognize the impairment loss of 5 and my revised carrying amount will become 100 or uh, 95. The revised carrying amount will become 95. The revised carrying amount will become 95. Right now further here, here my carrying amount is 95 and my fair value is 99. So what will I do? I will not recognize any impairment loss and my carrying amount will be 95 only. Now here again the carrying amount is 95 and if let's suppose the fair value is uh, let's suppose uh, 105 then again my carrying amount remains at 95 itself is that clear everyone is that clear everyone tell me is that clear everyone wonderful Imp important points on measurement principle depreciation as per the is 1638 or 40 and impairment as per is 36 ceases for non current assets or dispo disposal groups are not the industry groups for uh, non-current assets on which the measurement principle of IFRS 5 applies, impairment loss calculated above can be reversed if, if every LCTS increases. Okay. Now this point also you can ignore it off. Okay. This point also you can ignore it off. As of now you can ignore it off because I have not discussed specifically this part. So ignore it off as of now. There is not a reversal of impairment in any situation. No, reversal is there. Reversal is there. Reversal is there. Okay. So uh, let me uh, re re revise here also. Let me revise here also. I will not write that part. Let me not write that part itself. Let me not write that part itself. Let me not write that part itself. Okay. Because reversal I have not discussed. So I, I will remove. Reversal is not in your syllabus. Reversal I have not discussed. So I will remove reversal from here. Discussion. Now, impairment loss on IFRS uh, 5 uh, on goodwill. Okay, fine. This also I will remove. Now, tell me, is it clear everyone till here? Is it clear everyone till here? Come on, guys. Tell me, is it clear everyone till here? Now, further. Presentation the non current assets held for sale is classified as non current asset. Is a, is classified as a current asset in SOFP. Is classified as current asset in SOFP. Now discontinued operations. Discontinued operations. What is the meaning of discontinued operations? It says that 
the component of the entity uh, that has been uh, disposed of or classified as head for sale and represents separate major line of business like for example for itc for itc as a company uh, packaging department or tobacco department is a separate major line of business right so it can be said uh, and if itc plans to dispose of tobacco department it can be classified as discontinued operation okay now or a geographical area of operations right or a geographical area of operations right uh, now for example for that uh, the example which you can take is let's suppose let's suppose uh, pizza hut uh, or dominos uh, or kfc or uh, mcdonalds right let's suppose they say that i am exiting india i am exiting india okay now so uh, if they say so so they are uh, they are exiting a geographical area of operations they are exiting a geographical area of operations okay so that is called as a discontinued operation right um, a single part of single coordinate plan and it can be subsidiary acquired for viewed with a view to resale you can exclude this part also though it is in written but not required or you can continue to keep it off but it is same thing so not required to understand separately for this one part but understand uh, what i have noticed here the from the queries asked by the students when i said discontinued operation students understand that this uh, this part of the operation is already disposed of no my friend no no it can be the case that this operation is already disposed of during the year or it can be the case that this operation is held for disposal but not yet disposed will be disposed of in the next year okay will be disposed disposed of in the future is it clear everyone all of you is it clear everyone all of you tell me guys now presentation so a presentation of this continued operation so understand an entity should present and disclose information of discontinued operations separate from those of the continued operation so we discuss in the regular classes so when we prepare the p and l when we prepare the p and l so first of all we saw from the continuing operations what is my revenue what is my cost of sales what is my operating expenses what is my uh, finance cost what is my investment income then what is my tax expenses then what is my profit or loss from the continuing operations so i'm for the continuing operations i'm giving everything in detail now for the discontinued operations for the discontinued operations i will just give one single line item i will just give one single line item okay which will uh, which will uh, dis which will recognize the uh, everything revenue minus cost of sales minus uh, you can say uh, minus operating expense uh, plus investment income minus finance cost okay minus tax expense one single net profit from the discontinued operation it will it will be net of profit or loss on disposal if the if the discontinued operation is already disposed of if it is already disposed of this single line item will be net of will be net of the profit or loss on disposal is that clear everyone is that clear everyone wonderful okay but in the disc uh, see this is what i have to recognize in p and l but this is what i have to disclose in the notes to accounts this is what i will disclose in the notes to accounts what revenue and expenses for the discontinued operation profit before tax of the discontinued operation tax expenses of the discontinued operations profit after tax of the discontinued operations assets and liabilities of the discontinued operations cash flows of the discontinued operations earning per share basic and direct of the discontinued operations and one more thing okay loss or profit on disposal of discontinued operations okay if a discontinued operation remains unsold on a reporting date then it will be presented as a disposal group okay basically it will be presented as a non-current asset held for sale tell me is it clear everyone is it clear everyone is it clear everyone tell me guys come on the discontinued operation part or the most awaited topic part for you guys
that is the major mistake which a student does in the exam for a non current asset held for sale questions is they dip, uh, even uh, if the asset is classified as held for sale they try to depreciate the asset over the remaining useful life please do not do that mistake please do not do that mistake please do not do that mistake okay so uh, what we have to do here is what we have to do here is uh, in uh, in cases in cases where if the asset is classified as held for sale if an asset is classified as held for sale then in that case you will have to seize the depreciation on the asset you will have to seize the depreciation on the asset is that clear everyone done done the next part the topic number three provision contingent liabilities and contingent assets tell me do you guys need a break do you guys need a break so let's take a break of uh five minutes and then we'll resume back okay only five minutes only five minutes okay
now can you please confirm with the audio and video is clear to everyone clear wonderful thank you now starting with the third topic for the day that is provisions contingent liabilities and contingent assets now understand so before we discuss what exactly is the provision let us discuss what is a liability okay now the liability is a present obligation arising from past events settled by outflow of resources with economic benefits in future in future i have discussed the meaning of liability multiple times with you guys in the class right now coming to provisions when can we uh, recognize a provision when can we recognize a provision okay so this uh, recognition is nothing but the definition of the provision so let's discuss now when an entity has a present obligation arising from a past event and it is probable that the obligation will be settled it is probable that the obligation will be settled through outflow of resources embodying economic benefits and and you can reliably estimate the amount you can reliably estimate the amount means you have a present obligation means you have a present obligation means the means that you have to pay is certain the payment is certain the the happening of the event is certain okay means you have to pay is certain but when can be when you have to pay it can be uncertain what amount you have to pay uh, it might be uncertain so in these cases but you can reliably estimate the amount you can reliably estimate the amount okay so if you are able to reliably estimate the amount then yes you can recognize a provision if you are not able to estimate the amount then it will be disclosed as a contingent liability so there are three phases there are three phases so in the case in, in an obligation there are three phases one is called as liability the topmost the topmost then it is called as provision then it is called as contingent liability now understand the difference between these three see there are three things there are three things there are three things the topmost is a liability the topmost is a liability then is a provision and then it is a contingent liability how to determine whether you have to recognize see there is an obligation here there is an obligation here there is an obligation here and there is an obligation here as well but comes the question how to determine when do we need to recognize liability or when in which case we will recognize a provision and in which case we will recognize a contingent liability is the question is the question is the question this is the question okay this is the question do we need to recognize a liability a provision or a contingent liability so this is the question which needs to be answered which needs to be answered so let us discuss about this let us discuss about this come here okay now so what i told for a provision it is a present obligation arising out of past events okay it is probable that it will be settled in the future and you can reliably estimate the amount and you can reliably estimate the amount right now what is the meaning of present obligation arising out of past events so it says uh, it says that present obligation means probability of payment is more likely than not means it is greater than 50 percentage the probability of that you will have to pay the amount is more than 50 percentage if it is more than 50 percentage then yes you can you can say it is a uh, it is a present obligation and you have to recognize a, and you have to recognize a provision for the same okay now if it is a present obligation you might be required to okay let me write here let me write here let me write here if it is a present obligation if it is a present obligation you might be required to recognize a liability or you might be required to recognize a provision but how will you determine whether liability or provision i will discuss that let me discuss first the whole of it the past events that lead to present obligation are the obligating event it makes the entity bound to settle the contract okay the past event which has occurred let's suppose in the past i have purchased some goods in the past 
in the past i have discussed uh, i have i have purchased i have purchased some goods right now in the past if i have purchased some uh, goods then what happens it's a past events which makes me bound to pay the amount which makes me bound to pay the amount right now if it makes me bound to pay the amount it means what it's give rise to an obligation okay now the obligation are of two types by by virtue of nature or by virtue of probability of outflow it can be legal it can be constructive and i think i have discussed this part right legal means what by way of contract or by way of law by way of law okay now then what is the meaning of uh, by constructive by way of past practice or by the commitment of the entity okay now meaning thereby there is no contract or there is no contract or law which makes me bound to pay the amount but it's my own commitment it's my own commitment or it's my own past practices that i have followed okay which makes me obliged to do the, which makes me which gives me an obligation now if the if the probability of payment is more than 50 and up to 100 it is called as present obligation if the probability is more than 5 but less than 50 it is called as possible obligation if the probability of payment is less than 5 percent is called as remote obligation it is called as remote obligation it is called as remote obligation okay now law okay fine this is what i have discussed further moving on to the further in determining provision or a liability see this is the point which you have to discuss which you have to take care in determining provision or a liability an entity assesses these three things occurrence of payment occurrence means the certainty of payment the certainty whether i have to pay certainty or the probability okay the amount and the timing okay now come here if if it is a present obligation present obligation and amount and timing are certain meaning thereby occurrence amount and timing oath it is certain then you recognize a provision when occurrence is certain when the occurrence is certain but either amount or timing is uncertain 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 then it is called as provision then it is called as provision if the amount is uncertain then the entity must be able to reliably estimate the amount okay to recognize a provision what is the meaning of contingent liability it is a case of it is a case of present obligation it is a case of present obligation there is an obligation there is an obligation but there is an there is a present obligation there is a present obligation but amount and timing both are uncertain both are uncertain or it is a case of possible obligation or it is a case of possible obligation or it is a case of possible obligation then also it is a contingent liability okay now understand if occurrence amount timing all three are certain liability occurrence amount timing all three certain liability the, when second situation occurrence is certain but either amount or timing is uncertain occurrence is certain but either amount or timing is uncertain then a provision okay but if amount is uncertain then in that case the entity should be in a position to reliably estimate the amount then if the, the occurrence is certain then coming third scenario if the occurrence is certain but both amount and timing is are uncertain in provision i said either amount or timing in contingent liability i am saying both amount and timing are uncertain then it is a contingent liability or if it's a case of possible obligation then you must ask me sir what about pro remote obligation what about remote obligation what about remote obligation ignore it off what about remote obligation ignore it off okay remote obligation you need to ignore is it clear everyone tell me is it clear everyone when do you need to recognize a provision when do you need to recognize a li uh, liability and when do you need to recognize, uh, recognize a contingent liability is it clear everyone so uh, this is uh, recognized in uh, financial statements this is uh, recognized in financial statements this is uh, not uh, recognized this is not recognized this is disclosed in financial statements this is disclosed in financial statements okay now 
So journal entry for the expense uh, for this is expense account, expense account debit to provision for expense. Reimbursements is not for your syllabus. It is for SBR. So I'm removing it off. Now onerous contract. So this is special cases is a part of your syllabus. This is special cases is a part of your syllabus. So for example, if an entity takes an airport on lease and he has to pay uh, fix uh, 10 million after five years, then payment and timing is certain. Then why provision? If an entity takes airport on lease and he has to pay a fixed amount of 10 million after five years, then who told it is a provision? Who told it's a provision? Who told it's a provision? It's a liability. The example which you are given giving is the example of liability. It's not an example of provision. It's an example of liability. Like for example, let me tell you. Uh, let me tell you. Do you remember? Uh, do you remember uh, decommissioning liability? Do you remember de uh, provision for decommissioning costs? Yes. Tell me. Everyone, tell me. Do you remember provision for decommissioning costs? Now tell me. The occurrence was certain. The occurrence was certain that I have to pay the amount is certain, right? When I have to pay, it is certain. But what amount I have to pay, is it certain? No. Can I estimate? Yes. That's why it is a provision. That's why it is a provision. Uh, yes, Gupta, your company is making a provision. You tell me, I'll tell you why. Because that 10 million is not fixed. The 10 million would not be fixed. That's, the, that's why the company is making a provision. Okay. If that 10 million would have been a fixed amount, then that's not a provision, that's a liability. If that 10 million is a fixed amount, as per the contract, it is fixed, then that's a liability. That 10 million is subject to change. Okay, it is an estimate. If that 10 million which you are telling in the example is a estimate amount, then it's a provision. Uh, okay, uh, if it is a fixed amount as per the contract, then it is a liability. Like for example, in our uh, in our chapter of group accounting, we discussed about a deferred consideration. Tell me yes or no. We discussed about deferred consideration. Tell me yes or no. Amount was fixed. Timing was fixed. Payment was fixed. So deferred consideration is a liability. Deferred consideration is a liability. Right? Now, now onerous contract. So. Uh, First of all, let me discuss about restructuring. So now let's suppose if the entity has, wants to do the restructuring, if the, okay, okay, fine. Just a minute. Tell me uh, for a future loss, can I recognize a, uh, for a future loss, can I recognize a provision now? For a future loss, can I recognize the provision now? For a future loss, can I recognize a provision now? Tell me. No. Why? Because because that is that there, there is no obligation. Why? Because if I am doing a business and I see that in the future I will have a loss, I have an option to shut down the business and uh, escape the loss. I have the option to shut down the business and I escape a loss. Right. That's why there is uh, we don't recognize any we don't recognize any provision for the future operating losses. But now, if in the same in the same case of future operating losses, I if I if I just include one I, one line item, if I just include one thing that you cannot avoid that future operating losses, you cannot avoid that future operating losses. Then in that case, uh, tell me, do you need to recognize the provision? Do you rec need to recognize the provision? Yes, in that case, yes. Okay, so and that is called as onerous contracts. If as per the contract, you see, if as per the contract, is per the contract, uh, you will have a future operating losses, and you cannot cancel the contract, and you cannot cancel the contract, cancel the contract. Then in the case, in that case, future operating losses you have to recognize as a expense now. You have to recognize as a provision now. And we discussed about this in the chapter of revenue also, right? When the contract is a loss making contract, then we see what is the amount of future operating losses. Uh, we make a provision for that and add as a cost of sales, add as a add to the cost of sales. Right. So that's what it says that for onerous contracts, we are bound to execute the contract. We since we are since we are bound to execute the contract and uh, OK, that is loss making. OK, if the entity has an alternative to cancel, if the entity has an alternative to cancel the contract by payment of a penalty, then the provisions should be made of a lower 
lower of future operating losses or penalties let's suppose let's suppose i have a contract i have a contract which is not cancelable contract and i can see in this contract if i execute the contract i will have a loss of 4 million in the future i will definitely have a loss of 4 so what i have to do i have to recognize a loss of 4 million right but now now tell me logically now i in the contract there is a penalty clause there is a clause of cancellation of the contract wherein i can cancel the contract by just by paying just by paying a 2.5 million tell me what will you do should you shall you incur a loss of 4 million or you will cancel the contract but just by paying 2.5 million tell me what will you do tell me what will you do what a rational person will do a rational person will try to cancel the contract just by paying 2.5 million penalty right so the standard says that if the contract contract has a cancellation clause and uh, there is some penalty to be paid on cancellation there is some penalty to be paid on cancellation then in that case then in that case i will cancel the contract and pay 2.5 million and i will recognize the provision of 2.5 million now let's suppose i can cancel the contract without without paying any amount the with the penalty is zero then in that case what is the provision amount in that case what is the provision amount in that case what is the provision amount zero lower zero right so it it will be it will not be a case of onerous contract so basically what i'm trying to say if there are future operating losses if there are future operating losses which you can avoid which you can avoid then no provision is required for that that's what i'm trying to say uh gufran it can be any contract it can be any contract okay now decommissioning restoration and other liabilities i believe we have already discussed as part of is 16 is it clear everyone that uh, on the date of initial recognition we have to recognize this as at the present value at the present value right uh, since the amount uh, at, to be paid in the future is not certain is not just an estimate hence we are recognizing at present value right then subsequently we have to unwind the present value and we have to record the finance cost this initially the general entry will become what uh, asset account debit to provision for decommissioning cost subsequently the general entry will become what finance cost account debit to provision for decommissioning costs right on the date of settlement that is at the end of the useful life i will pay the decommissioning cost that is provision for decommissioning cost account debit to bank if i have paid anything extra or less that will be transferred to pnl okay on an actual basis now restructuring provisions so it says that if the standard if the entity is planning for a restructuring and there is a detailed formal plan and the plan is communicated to the affected parties then yes for the restructuring specifically the entity can make a provision the entity can make a provision okay now warranties we discussed this as part of ifrs 15 revenue chapter okay we discussed this that uh, if uh, if there is a warranty if there is a warranty okay warranty can be of two types uh, inbuilt warranty or we call it as a standard warranty the example he, the, it is called as inbuilt warranty or it is also called as standard warranty here it is called as extended warranty or it is also called as additional warranty okay now it says that inbuilt warranty or uh, standard warranty uh, there is it is not a separate performance obligation and the entity needs to recognize a provision for under is 37 now extended warranty or additional warranty is a separate pro uh, performance obligation under ifrs 15 revenue standard okay and hence we will recognize a pro revenue over the warranty period i hope it is clear everyone warranties point tell me guys is it, i hope it is clear to everyone Sir, uh, what if the company stops working on the project but it had made a decommissioning provision, uh, then what to do? What if the company stops working on the project but it had made a decommissioning provision? Now understand, decommissioning provision is for an asset. Decommissioning provision is for the asset. Now, you mean to say the company has stopped working the asset? Stop working on the asset. Now, if the company stops working on the asset, then what will what will I do? I will impair the asset. I will impair the asset. I will impair the asset. And if the company uh, D uh, recognizes, okay, if the company D recognizes the asset, okay, or whenever whenever I am required to actually settle this decommissioning provision, whenever I am actually re required to uh, settle this decommissioning provision, then I will pay off. I will pay off. The differential will be transferred to P and L. Okay. contingent liabilities what is the meaning of contingent liabilities See, just now i discussed it is a case of uh, it is a case of present obligation arising from past events where a liability or a provision cannot be recognized or it is a case of possible obligation that arises from past events whose existence will be confirmed only by the occurrence or non occurrence occurrence or non occurrence 
of one or more future or certain events wholly not wholly within the control of the entity meaning thereby if it is a case of possible obligation either it is a case of possible obligation or it is a case of present obligation or it is a case of present obligation but both amount and timing are uncertain okay now if that's the case i will recognize a contingent liability what is the accounting treatment contingent liabilities are disclosed as part of the notes to accounts in the financial statements okay now contingent assets what is the contingent asset contingent asset is a possible asset that arises from past events whose existence will be confirmed only by the occurrence or non occurrence of one or more future uncertain events not wholly within the control of the entity contingent assets are not recognized unless the uncertainties attached are resolved okay so this completes our chapter on provisions even uh, provisions contingent liabilities and contingent assets tell me is it clear everyone anyone having any queries in this chapter anyone having any queries in this chapter Wonderful. Guys, today you guys are not giving me boosters. You forgot to give boosters or what? How is the Joe's? How is the Joe's? The Joe's is should be always high. Right now, topic number four events occurring after the reporting date. Events occurring after the reporting date. Riddhi is super high. Oh, very good, very good, very good. Now, what is the meaning of events occurring after the reporting date? Events occurring after the reporting date. Now, understand. See, this is uh, this is the let's suppose the start of the reporting period. Let's suppose this is January, first of January. This is 1st of January. Let's suppose this is 1st of January, start of the reporting period, end of the reporting period. That is 31st of December. Okay, this is the reporting period. So, what we say it, this is your reporting period. This is your reporting period. And this is the 31st December. Okay, this is the date when the financial statements are authorized by the management or approved by the management. Why yes, it's a quite easy topic. It's quite an easy topic. Okay, now uh, this is the date. Let's suppose this date is called as this date is called as 15th of May. Or let me write here 18th May. Let me write here 18th of May. Okay, now. I will not tell the relevance of this date. Those who can understand, if you can guess and understand, it's good. Okay. Now, so 31st of December is the reporting date, is the reporting date. It is called as reporting date. This date is called as the date when the FS are approved. Date when the FS are approved or authorized. Okay. Okay. FS are approved. So this period this uh, period this period is called as okay i'm sorry i'm sorry i uh, i used to take example of 31st of march so that's why i have given here 30, 18th of may okay let me write here uh, 18th of uh, february okay let me write here 14th of february 14th feb this date is good this date is good tell me this date is good okay now so this period from first 31st december that is from 31st of december okay uh, this is let's suppose 2022 this is 2022 and this is uh, 2023 31st december 2022 to 14th february 2023 this period is called as events occurring after the report 
yes good for the committed ones now this is called as the period this is the period which uh, this standard talks about this is the period which is the standard talks about okay this is the period which the standard talks about okay now we are not covering uh, the period after 14th of february we are not covering the period after 14th of february no we are not covering this period okay from here to here okay not covered by see here i have written here events after no so not covered it is uh, not covered by ias 10 it is not covered by ias 10 tell me guys is uh the scope of the standard clear for to everyone is the scope of the standard clear to everyone so this is our scope if i have to highlight with red pen this is our scope this is our scope this is the scope of ias 10 okay now so what is the meaning of approval of financial statements it means approved by the board of directors it means approved by the board of directors okay now don't say approved by the shareholders no shareholders doesn't approve the okay shareholders doesn't approve the financial statements okay now the financial statements are approved by the board of directors if you see a financial statements just uh, after this class just go and see the financial statements okay in the financial statements you will see the signature of the directors and the directors and the auditor you will not see any signature of the uh, shareholders right so in the financial statements of reliance you will see the signature of uh, mukesh ambani right and their auditors and their auditors okay now so this standard talks about two events one is called as adjusting event and one is called as non-adjusting event now what is the meaning of adjusting event and what is the meaning of non-adjusting event so it says that events events that has occurred between events that has occurred between first of uh 31 first of jan january 2023 to 14th of february 2023 events that has occurred between this period that provide evidence of conditions existing at the date of the reporting date okay so that's what that's what i'm trying to say here understand guys please events that occurred between 1st january 2023 between 1st january to 14th feb okay even if, if there are any events that occurs in this period which provides condition which provides conditions that existed on the reporting date that provides conditions that provides that provides a uh, confirmation about the conditions existing on the reporting date that is an existing event so then it is an adjusting event then it is an adjusting event or otherwise it's a non-adjusting event otherwise it's a non-adjusting event tell me let's suppose in this period my factory caught fire Tell me, were you aware that your factory will get, uh, will, caught, will catch fire on 31st December? Were you aware of it? Tell me. Were you aware of it? Or you made a provision of it? Tell me. Were you aware of it or made a provision of it? Tell me. No. No. So it is not, it is a, it is a non-adjusting event. Now, uh, the, the area in which uh, your factory was located. So, uh, uh, okay. So that area got destroyed by floods. Did you predict the floods? Tell me. On 31st of December, did you predict something like the floods that are coming? Tell me. Did you predict something like floods are coming? No. Right? We didn't predict. Right? Uh, if uh, it was not predicted, if it was the conditions didn't exist on the reporting date, if the conditions didn't exist on the reporting date, then what we say? They are non-adjusting event. Okay? I have written the multiple examples of it. I have written multiple examples of it. Now, so these fire or floods, these are called as non-adjusting events. Now, let me tell you an example of adjusting event. Okay? Let me tell you an example of adjusting event. Let's suppose. Let's suppose. A court was uh, a case was ongoing. A case was ongoing. Okay, on 31st December, a case was ongoing, and it was highly probable. It was highly probable that uh, you will lose the case, and if you lose the case, you have to pay a penalty of dollar ten thousand. Okay, you it was it was uh, highly probable, and on first uh, and on uh, 15th of January, the result of the case comes in the court of law. The result of the ca uh, case comes in the court of law that yes, you have lost the case. 
okay so yes for this for this you have to recognize a for this you have to recognize a provision or a liability according to the situation okay now these are called as adjusting events these are called as adjusting events okay now i have given written examples of it the adjusting events a settlement of the court case okay uh, now that confirms that the entity had a present obligation at the end of the reporting date sale of inventories purchase or sale of assets within the reporting period but determination of the consideration after the end of the reporting period okay uh, so i have given multiple examples i will request you all of you to read these examples okay so in the exam uh, might be the case that one of these examples can come okay so read these examples for the adjusting event and for the non adjusting events also okay so for these just read just read this uh, and have have it in the mind okay keep it in your mind okay so i have explained the meaning of the adjusting and non adjusting event now what is the treatment so adjusting events are adjusted in the financial statements but non adjusting events they are not recognized in the financial statements rather they are they, rather they are just disclosed in the financial statements okay that too if they are material that too if they are material that too if they are material okay like for example like for example uh, a major uh, major business combination or disposal of a major subsidiary after the reporting period okay uh, after the reporting period you are uh, uh, acquiring a big company okay you are acquiring a big company okay let's suppose uh, uh, on uh, on uh, on 15th of may on on uh, 15th of january on 15th of january on 15th of january uh, floods came okay or uh, my factory caught fire so it was a, it was a significant event it was a significant event can i adjust in the financial statements no i cannot adjust but I need to disclose it to the investors. I need to disclose it to the investors. Okay. So uh, adjusting means I will adjust the, I will adjust in the financial statements. I will pass a journal entry for that. Adjusting means I will pass a journal entry for that. Okay. Now, for example, uh, say uh, you can say settlement of a court case. I might have to recognize a provision or a liability for that. I might have to recognize a provision or a liability for that. Okay. Now, but for floods or the fire, I will not recognize what is the loss of the due to fire, what is the loss due to floods. No, I will not recognize, but yes, I will disclose that. I will disclose that. So is that clear the meaning of the types of events? Is that clear everyone? Tell me guys, come on. Is that clear everyone? All of you? No, further. Special cases. A special case says that if there is a see understand i told that ies 10 says that what i told here is that ias 10 says that there can be two events adjusting events and uh, non adjusting events adjusting events we have to uh, uh, recognize in financial statements okay now non adjusting events i have to just give a disclosure in financial statements okay or or if this non adjusting event is uh, significant to a level that it impacts that it impacts if it impacts going concern assumption if it impacts going concern assumption let's suppose my factory caught fire and it was the only one factory which i had okay and now this factory had caught fire so i might not be able to continue my business i might not be able to continue my business itself in the in the future so this gives rise to a question on the going concern of the entity this gives rise to a question on the going concern of the entity so if that is the case then standard says that even though it is non adjusting it will be deemed it will be deemed that it is an adjusting event it is an adjusting event and uh, and if it is an adjusting event what we will do you will prepare fs on realization basis is it clear everyone tell me guys is it clear everyone tell me guys come on
now the last topic for the day that is uh, topic number five effects of changes in the foreign exchange rates but before i start that please tell me is that clear everyone is that clear everyone <coughs> effects of changes in foreign exchange rates now uh, see understand when we talk about foreign currency when we talk about foreign currency the standard uh, is ka, standard says that the currencies are of three types standard says that the currencies are of three types okay one is called as functional currency another is called as foreign currency and another is called as presentation currency you must be wondering sir where is where is home currency where is home currency so there is no concept of home currency uh, in uh, ias earlier it used to be there used to be a concept of home currency in the local indian standards there is a concept of home currency uh, okay uh, it used to be a concept okay uh, now but that concept is no more relevant now why the standard says that the standard says that uh, there is no concept of home currency now it can be the case that a company in india might have a uh, might 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 have a currency of might uh, might report its financial statements in a currency of dollars okay how to identify how to identify the functional currency is the currency in which the fs are presented primarily fs uh, the fun functional currency is the currency in which the fs are presented primarily primarily okay okay now now understand understand if my funks uh, understand uh, how to determine what uh, which is the functional currency and which is the foreign currency and which is the presentation currency for so for, uh, for that first let us understand the meaning of each of them so it says the fu functional currency is the currency of the primary economic environment in which the in entity operates per in currency of the primary economic environment let's suppose for a for a for a country like india for a country like india india any entity in which is there in india what is the currency of the primary economic environment it's rupee it's rupee for an, for a, for any company in headquartered in india the currency of the primary economic environment is rupee is rupee but it is not the only point it is not the only point you have to identify what is the primary economic environment though for india and for any other country the default primary economic uh, currency is their home currency the default primary economic currency environment is their default is their home currency okay default is their home currency but uh, we have to see other factors also what are the other factors see currency that uh, influences the sale price of the goods and services currency of the country whose competitive forces and regulations determine sales prices okay currency that influences cost price of the goods delivered and services rendered let's suppose though i am based out of india but i teach students only and only based out of uk and nowhere else i am teaching students only and only for uk students nowhere else tell me my, the the price that i have to fix is in inr or uh, in uh, pounds tell me the price that i'll fix is in INR, will be in inr or in pounds it will be in pounds it will be in pounds right now now when i compare see when uh, we as a faculties when we uh, when we uh, keep our prices when we keep our prices we see what uh, what are the prices of our competitors right what are the prices of our competitors now when i am when i am teaching to the students based out of uk i will see that my competitors there in uk are charging how much they are charging how much right they are charging how much so the competitive forces of india is not applying on me in that case the competitive forces of uk applies to me okay so the, in that case you can say the the currency of the primary economic environment is not inr in that it is pounds in that case okay the currency in which the finances are obtained so if uh, it's not that all of these has to be satisfied so you have to assess on a case to case basis that what is the functional currency uh, will a question come in the exam to determine a functional currency no okay they might ask you these factors but they will not ask you to determine a functional currency okay now what is the meaning of foreign currency any currency other than functional currency is i is a foreign currency any currency other than functional currency is a foreign currency okay now what is the meaning of presentation currency any currency any currency other than functional currency in which financial statements are to be prepared for reporting requirements let's suppose let's suppose 
since i am uh, teaching the students based out of uk so i have to the uk regulator i have to uh, i have to present my financial statements also okay now uh, now now okay so what will happen so uh, uk is my so in that in my case my, my pounds were my functional currency pounds were my functional currency and i have to report uh, i have to report the financial statements to the uk regulator so definitely i will present my financial statements to the uk in pounds okay now since i am residing in india don't you think uh, i will have to i will have to uh, report my financial statements in inr to the government right to the roc to the indian uh, indian uh, regulator i will have to report the financial statements now will i report my financial statements in pounds they will not accept they will need the financial statements in rupees inr right so now uh, this is called as the presentation currency any currency in which i am presenting my financial statements any currency in which i present my financial statement but except for functional currency except for functional currency okay is it clear everyone the meaning of uh, foreign currency uh, functional currency and presentation currency is it clear everyone tell me guys come on wonderful now the treatment of foreign currency transactions the treatment of foreign currency transactions so on uh, on the date of initial recognition on the date of initial recognition you will uh, recognize the transaction based on exchange rate at the date of transaction okay whatever is the exchange rate on the date of transaction you will recognize that that is not a challenge the student make a mistake here the student makes mistake here subsequently subsequently at each reporting date you have to assess whether it is a non monetary item or it is a monetary item now what is the difference between a non monetary item and a monetary item understand non monetary item the example is like ppe property plant and equipment it can be intangible assets it can be you can say uh, investment property right uh, not investment property i will definitely not purchase investment property uh, from uh, foreign okay now what uh, it can be anything though though it can be anything it can be anything it can be anything it can be anything okay now it can be anything but uh, it is not it can be anything except for anything except for anything except for foreign currency monetary items now comes the question what is the meaning of what is the meaning of foreign currency monetary items so it says it is a receivable or payable the and the amount is fixed as per contract and the amount is fixed as per the contract okay and it is payable or receivable in foreign currency okay receivable or payable in foreign currency and the amount is fixed as per the contract okay now for that so what the standard says that you have to restate or at each reporting date and the gain or loss on restatement is recognized in p and l whether realized or unrealized whether realized or unrealized you have to recognize it in p and l is it clear everyone now the standard says that again the examining team says that be very careful when converting an amount to functional currency when you are converting the foreign currency to functional currency be very careful why uh, you have to be very careful whether you have to divide or multiply okay if you have solved any question on this you will understand what i am trying to say is that clear everyone tell me is that clear everyone tell me now let me take up an example and explain this part let me take up an example and explain this part okay now example first january first june 31st december okay i purchased purchased uh, a machinery purchased a machinery okay uh, costing for not uh, costing right here for uh, for pounds you can say uh, 10000 for 10000 pounds okay now the life of the machine is 5 years uh, you can write here 1st of july not june 1st of july okay life of the machine is 5 years okay and the exchange rate okay and the functional currency right here functional currency of this company is dollar in the exam in the exam whenever the question comes up if they mentions or they don't mention assume that uh, see if they mention something else fine if they are not mentioning anything assume that the functional currency is dollars 
okay now uh, exchange rate can you tell me what is the exchange rate of pound versus dollars what is the exchange rate of pound versus dollars can you can anyone help me okay so exchange rate is uh, 0 0.79 uh, pounds for each dollar 0 0.79 pounds for each dollar okay now so uh, and here the exchange rate is 0 0.84 pounds for each dollar for each dollar now how will you record this transaction okay on this date what is the general entity that will pass and on this date what is general entity that will pass is my question okay now so on this date you will record a journal entry you will record that a machinery sorry machinery account debit to uh, and you have not paid okay the amount will be right here amount will be paid amount will be paid on uh, 20 uh, at February next year okay now so what is journal entry on this date machinery account debit to uh, payable so what is uh, amount uh, amount is 10,000 pounds 10,000 pounds so 10,000 pounds divided by 0.79 is uh, 12658 one two so it is a uh, dollar one two six five eight dollar one two six five eight is that clear everyone tell me is that clear everyone so on the date of initial recognition i am using the transaction the exchange rate on the date of transaction i am using the exchange rate on the date of transaction is that clear everyone tell me guys come on is that clear everyone is this generally clear to everyone now subsequently on 31st of december subsequently on 31st of december what will i do what will i do i will depreciate the asset i will depreciate the asset i will depreciate the asset right now when i will depreciate the asset so what will you depreciation so 12658 divided by 5 years multiplied by half year is equals to how much 6 by 12 right 126 uh, 12658 uh, divided by 5 divided by 2 is uh, 1266 1266 so general entry will be depreciation expense account debit to asset 1266 now tell me will i restate the machinery no it is a non monetary item subsequently machinery is a non monetary item so i will not do anything i will account for it so i will account for it normally i will account for it normally as per the respective standards okay but now payable but now payable is a payable is a monetary item is a foreign currency monetary item right so now what was the amount payable amount payable was pounds 10000 right now what is the uh, restated liability what is the restated liability the restated liability is uh exchange is 0.84 so 10,000 divided by 0 0.84 it is it is 11905 it is called as 11905 it is called as 11905 right now so your liability has reduced your liability has reduced from 12658 to 11905 now what will you do you will recognize a gain so what you will do liability account debit to forex gain and this is unrealized this is unrealized okay this is unrealized okay how much 1 minus 1 2 6 5 8 is equals to 753 753 753 and where will the 753 go it will go to it will go to p and l now subsequently again subsequently again subsequently at a repo at the payment date on the payment date exchange rate is exchange rate is let's suppose 0.89 uh, 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 
pounds uh, per one dollar per one dollar then what will happen then what will happen then what will happen in that case your liability will be equals to how much 0.89 uh, okay 10,000 divided by 0.89 is equals to 11236 11236 okay now again what will you do you will write here liability account debit how much was the liability earlier 11905 right but you will pay how much you will pay how much you will pay only 11236 and the difference will be called as a realized gain realized forex gain realized forex gain okay how much uh minus one one uh nine zero five is six sixty nine six sixty nine okay so this will also go to p and l this will also go to p and l whether realized or unrealized all of them will go to p and l now one more point one more point now if the asset is under fair value model if the asset is under fair value model if the uh, non-monetary item if the if any non-monetary item is under fair value model then in that case what will you do uh, you will uh, calculate what is the fair value in foreign currency what is the fair value in foreign currency what is the fair value in foreign currency calculate okay then 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 let's suppose this foreign this uh, this fair value in foreign currency amounts to amounts to let's suppose a uh, uh, pound uh, pound on 31st December okay uh, amounts to pound uh, 10,500 10,500 okay now now what is the exchange rate exchange rate is let's suppose a uh, pound 0 0.84 is to one dollar okay then what is the fair value in a uh, functional currency what is the fair value in a uh, functional currency it is equals to 10,500 divided by 0 0.84 is equals to 12,000 500 10500 divided by 0.84 is equal to 10, oh yes right this is the now what is the carrying amount in functional currency on that date what is the carrying amount in functional currency on that date it was uh, how much 1265 12658 minus 1266 is 11392 is 11392 okay how did i arrive at 12658 was the initial amount then i depreciated the asset by 1266 so it is the amount okay now this amount comes to how much 12500 is 1108 1108 this will be recognized this can be recognized in p and l or it can be recognized in oci okay depending let's suppose it this is a this is a let's suppose this is a, you can say a property plan and equipment okay if it's the property plan and equipment you will recognize in pnl if uh no sorry if it is a property plan and equipment you will recognize in oci if it is an investment property you will recognize in p and l is that clear everyone tell me is that clear everyone tell me is that clear everyone wonderful uh, so this completes our uh, revision of the five topics this completes our revision of the five topics now don't leave i will have i have a point to say here uh, this completes my, the revision of the five topics so uh, i have uh, helped you in the revision of all the major topics okay now the fun the revision video for the financial instruments the revision video for the group accounts the revision video for the interpretation of financial statements is already there on my youtube channel which you can watch off okay for the remaining chapters also there are revision videos uh for the previous session which i conducted okay so it is there in my youtube channel which you can watch again okay now one more point tomorrow okay now today all of you what will you will do uh you will have to solve a acca fr pre mock uh, exam for september 2023 okay all of you will solve this paper all of you will solve this paper and and for section a and section b get yourself marked from the uh, examining platform itself section c i will be discussing tomorrow section c i will be discussing tomorrow is that clear to everyone is that clear to everyone
ओके दैट्स ऑल फॉर डे गाइस थैंक यू बाय same timing for tomorrow same timing for tomorrow okay and yes don't forget to uh, leave your comments in the as a feedback in the comment box okay don't forget to leave your comments in the comment box okay bye bye